Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to a wonderful Monday morning. Hope everybody had a nice weekend. Uh, we are in the series uh, measurement training. And with measurement training specifically, we're going into signals and we've been over some other lessons that uh, go into totalizers and things like that. So if you want to see some of the other uh, lessons that we've done, please go to our website or to YouTube and you can look for the CRT services. Really trying to concentrate on this one about not saying the word um. So if I have pauses or my face turns red, it's because I'm trying to think of something besides the word uh, oh, um, something like that. So getting started, my name is Brent Palmer. I'm with the uh, CRT services. I am the measurement of management techno measurement technology. What that basically means is I'm just involved in measurement and how CRT looks at technologies and implements those technologies to help our customers. What we saw was with the, with the virus and everything that's going on in the industry, most of the training events have been canceled uh, for the next few months. So we wanted to kind of bridge that gap, present some of the topics that are at issue in some of the other events and try to bring in other presenters to help us do that. These are meant to be short and sweet and uh, if there's any topics that you guys want to go over, please email them to us, or let me know, and we will try to get a uh, subject matter expert to go over it. If you want to be a presenter yourself, we'd love to have you. All we're doing with these videos is we're just posting them up onto YouTube on the CRT channel so that they have access to everybody in the industry and outside the industry. So please share them along. And uh, if you have any ideas, like I said, let us know. Today, what we're going to talk about in this session is analog loops and specifically what we use analog loops for. Uh, they've been around for a very long time, since the mid-50s. What are the, some of the tricks and, and uh, some of the uh, problems that we've run into with analog loops? But they're pretty simplistic and uh, hopefully at the end of this, you're going to see just how simplistic they are. I'm going to equate them to my, my kind of thinking about how an analog loop works and hopefully that you, I'm somebody who has, always has to have an analogy to try to bring it down to the, some complex things and bring them down to my simplistic way of thinking. And you may listen to what I'm saying and say, well, that's just plain old stupid and just try to equate it to something that, that hopefully helps you uh, make sense out of these loops. So what are analog loops? Uh, basically, it's just information that is processed and transmitted uh, with varying amounts of voltage or current. So these loops, you can be current or they can be uh, amperage based. And what you're trying to do is we're just bringing process information along on this. So we have a scaled process value. Let's just use something simple like temperature and we have zero and we have a hundred. So zero degrees to a hundred degrees and we want to precisely feed that back into another device. Well, before the advent of Modbus communications and some other uh, digital communication processes, there was no real way to bring this information uh, back accurately, as accurate as we are right now, that we can do with analog signals. And we're gonna get into some examples of analog signals and I'll explain how the scaling works on those, the calibration gotchas, but again, right now we're just going over the kind of the process. The 4 to 20 milliamp loop is probably the, uh, the most common that's out there. It's very ideal for transmissions. Um, all the signaling current flows through all the components, and I'll explain what that means in, in a little bit, but the same current flows even if the wire terminations are in less than perfect conditions. All the component in, in the loop are uh, drop voltage <laughs> due to the signaling current flowing through them. So basically, uh, I've got a camera looking right in my face, so there's parts of my screen that I can't see. If not, I kind of look up like this, so that's why I had to move my head around to see my own slide. And uh, the signaling current is not affected by the power supply voltage. So this is a basic loop. And the way that I can equate it kind of simplistically is if you have a, a garden hose and I'm going to create a water loop. Well, I've got a source of the water. And if I send that water through something, let's say a paddle wheel, 
where it makes a paddle wheel go around. And that water is going to return back to the source so I can keep on recirculating. So if I break that at any point, I can't really measure how much water is going through. Let's use the, uh, let's use the paddle wheel kind of as a resistance to the water. And what I can do is, as that loop's going around, if I know I'm sending out a 24-volt signal and I'm measuring resistance from 4 to 20 milliamps of, of amperage going across that, the more that I increase the resistance, the more my amperage is going to go up. So my resistance is going to go up. My flow is going to go down a little bit as far as coming through. So what I'm going to see is, as I go through this, this loop, I'm going to see my resistance go up higher, and I'm going to start measuring a dis different amount of resistance on my 4 to 20 milliamp loop. So these are a hose system, or basically if I break any point of that, if it's not returned back, unlike a digital signal where I can just send that signal out, and I don't necessarily have to have a path back to my system, I have to create a loop here. I got to create that garden hose. So what we do is when we put a transmitter into this loop, we're sending we have resistance of the wire, and if I look on the signal that I have, I've got a power supply, and I'm sending voltage out, and the wire has a certain amount of resistance. When I go through the transmitter, I'm basically going to change the resistance based upon the process signal that I'm sending out, and then that loop comes back, I have a little more resistance, and then I come back into my analog input device that I'm actually measuring what the, uh, what the analog value is. So I supply voltage, I go through my transmitter, I come out of my transmitter, and then I measure that circuit and determine what the, what the milliamps are on that circuit. So with that, we need to make sure a couple different things. One is I can't really measure the amount of milliamps by just putting two leads across that transmitter. I can measure the voltage, but I can't measure the, the milliamps. I have to be in series with the loop to, in order to measure that. So if I'm building something, uh, if I'm building a, a transmitter loop and I want to check the milliamp value outside of the device that's reading it, I actually need to put my meter in series with it. I can't go in parallel where I just touch the two leads and go across it. So that's very important to remember when you're checking these out. You'll see that on most of the meters, you have a milliamp setting and when you turn it there, you have to put your probe over into a milliamp and then put it into series with that circuit. So here is an example of an internally powered where the device is supplying 24 volts and I'm measuring the milliamp input. So I take 24 volts out, I come to the plus side of the transmitter, off the negative side of the transmitter or the signal side of the transmitter, I'm coming out and I'm going into the plus of my analog input signal. And then my reference, my common, in this case is jumpered internally to go to the common of the power supply. I have to have that reference of my power supply. If I didn't have this jumper in and I didn't know what the common was, I would have no signal here. And a lot of times with the four to 20 milliamp loops, what we find is when people are trying to measure them, that they create this portion of the loop, but they haven't created the, the portion where they've jumpered the common. A lot of times analog signals, uh, in the case of the FlowX flow computer, the analog inputs are isolated from the digital inputs and they're also isolated from the analog outputs. So I have to make sure that I'm referencing whatever the common is for this loop and I have to create a jumper between the, the, the um, analog common and whatever the common of the power supply that I'm using is. So this is if it's internally powered. Now what if I have a, a transmitter from, um, oops, I'm going all over the place. Hold on, let me get back. But that, what happens if I have a transmitter from uh, where the power is coming, in this case, from an external device? So I've got 24 volts coming off a power supply. I'm going through the transmitter and then coming into an analog input on my device. But I still have to make sure that that analog input common is then referenced to the analog power supply. So I know what that, that common is, what that zero reference is for the voltage coming in. So it's very important that I, I, I basically bond these together, my commons, or else I won't be able to measure anything. You'll have it hooked up, and you may see voltage, but you won't be measuring anything because you're not at the same, you're not utilizing the same common or reference common. So, 
we refer to some of these circuits as floating grounds, where basically you've got a voltage is, uh, voltage is always measured between two points, a point of high potential and a point of low potential or zero potential. Or the term reference point denotes the point of low potential because it's the point where the voltage, uh, where we're referencing that voltage. So what can happen is when I have a power supply, 120 volt, 120 volt power supply, I may be giving uh, 24 volts out of that power supply, but you'll notice we have uh, on these power supplies, I'll go back up a couple, that I have a plus for my 24 and a negative, but I'm feeding in 120 volts and that 120 volts is coming in with a, with a common or an earth ground. Well, if I don't reference that neutral or the earth ground in that system, then my, my, uh, my circuit is considered floating that I don't have a reference to earth ground. I have a reference to a common on my, my power supply. So if I bond that to ground, then I can run into some issues when I, when I bond a ground to, uh, when I bond a common to just a normal uh, ground, let's say for, if you were to take a high uh, accuracy uh, electronic system and bond it to the ground of your house, the grounding uh, references back to the power supply. You can have induced voltages on the power uh, grounds coming in also. So a lot of times what you'll hear is a triad ground where we create a uh, three ground bar system and join those in a triangle and it's a separate instrumentation ground and that's the reference for ground for everything within that low voltage circuit. So uh, floating grounds, they can run into problems because floating grounds we also can run into where we start to accumulate voltage and voltage should start to increase as we have no way to dissipate voltage a lot of times on these floating grounds. So most times we don't utilize a floating ground system. Um, so the earth ground, the earth and ground are perhaps the most misunderstood terms in electronics. The difference comes down to a matter of qualifying a reference point. The term earth means the, the planet earth. And the planet Earth is essentially an infinite reservoir of electrons. Um, and I know I'm just reading off this. You guys can read that yourself, too. The point of contact with Earth reference is generally achieved by driving a conductor spike several feet into the ground, ensuring a solid Earth connection. Thus, the term Earth ground denotes a connection to the actual Earth reference point. So a lot of times what you'll see, too, is that uh, those Earth grounds, depending on the soil conditions, depending on the, uh, the length the rod was driven, over time, those earth grounds can become ineffective. I've actually seen where uh, earth grounds over a point of time, uh, if there's been no rain, actually start becoming very poor grounds because uh, basically you, you, I'm not conducting any, any electricity through there because I have a very dry bed soil, a, a sandy soil versus a wet clay soil. Obviously going to earth, the wet clay soil is gonna be able to conduct uh, electrons a lot more efficiently than just a dry air gapped uh, sandy system. So you can see ground beds start to dry up after a while. In the perfect world, all ports of a grounding system will be at the same potential, but in reality, it's not, it's not uncommon for different points of the same grounding system to slit, sit at uh, slightly different potentials. And where that comes into play is if I drive a ground rod here and then drive a ground rod 20 feet away, then the potential between those should theoretically be the same because they're both driven into the ground. I put them both 16 feet into the ground, but if I, if I measure that, I may have a difference of potential. So if I'm grounding at different points across, along my circuit, I can have difference of uh, potential across those and it will change the analog potential that I have and throw off my readings. So bonding power supplies, why do we do it? Again, we're trying to get to those, the, the reference in those grounds that, that we want to have a common reference. You know, you and I both want to have a reference when we're, uh, we're going to exchange money. So our reference is gold. Gold's worth a dollar per ounce, let's say. And if I give you a dollar bill, that reference is one ounce of, or uh, one pound of gold or one ounce of gold, and it's the, the same. We need to have a reference and a common here that I know that at zero volts, I'm at the same potential of ground that zero volts over here means. And when we bound those together, we make sure that we are both looking at the same exact reference across there. So a little confusing, but not, not, not really. We're just trying to get to that same point. Um, again, if I walk into a room and say it's 75 degrees and it truly is 75 degrees and you have a reference when you walk into your house and say it's 75 degrees, 
that we both know what 75 degrees is and feels like, but if we, if we are out of reference with each other, then we can be off a little bit and not read the same exact thing. So we're at the point where I typically have some, some questions, but what I wanted to show you is, what do we do with these analog signals? Well, we bring them back in for process information, like I said. So the way that we set these up, and we'll set up a, uh, let's set up a temperature transmitter. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into a flow computer, and I am gonna go to an analog input. And we're gonna go over a little bit of what this information means. So I'm gonna go into analog input number two, and I'm going to put a tag in here, and I'm just, the tag is solely to let me know what this is going to be used for within the system. So temperature. Now, on this analog input, it can be a few different things. It can be at a 4 to 20, 0 to 20, 1 to 5 volts DC, or 0 to 5 volts DC. We're going to keep it at 4 to 20 milliamps. So what this means is, is my starting point is going to be four milliamps. Four is going to be not process zero as far as if I have a temperature that's minus 50 to 100, but it's going to be my starting point where, where when I go on my scale, and if it's a four to 20 milliamp signal, it, my scale is 16 milliamps, right? Because I subtract four from 20, that gives me 16 milliamps of range that I'm able to change the milliamp value to represent a process value. So we're gonna use four to 20. We're gonna use the arithmetic mean of averaging, which basically when we look at averaging, that signal is doing this. And that's a very, very extreme, but that signal is changing a little bit. And if it's changing during the course of our processing, we, can, we do a little bit of an averaging because it's gonna fluctuate just a, just a touch. So what we do is um, inside the FlowX, we actually look at, uh, in the course of a second, 12 averages. We take that 12 times and we average that. And then we use that every calculation cycle. So every half second, we have a 12 point average that's over the past second. And that's what we use as our process input. If I'm doing differential pressure, I wanna use the root mean square because the root mean square allows me to go both negative and positive in my process values. So we're gonna stay with the arithmetic mean. And the first thing this is asking me is, what is it at full scale? So at 20 milliamps, what is my process value? Well, in this case, let's say it's 150 degrees. What is it now at zero? My four milliamps, well, we can, put that at minus 50. So I've got a range of 200 from minus 50 to 150. So 50, 50, 50 degrees of movement to get to zero and then from zero to 150, 150. So that gives me 200. If I look and do a, a little quick calculation, I can go and say, okay, if I have 200 degrees of movement, but I only have 16 milliamps of movement that I'm allowed to do, then for every milliamp, my temperature is gonna change 12.5 degrees. But when I look at these milliamps, we go down to the 10th, the 100th, the thousandth of a, a decimal place in their resolution. So they're, they're extremely accurate. So I may not, I won't go four milliamps and five milliamps, I'll go 4.035 milliamps. And that will give me a process value and it's based upon this scale. Now the last two settings that we have here are, we're 102.5% uh, and negative 2.5% for the fails. So basically on the high side, if I wind up going 2.5% over 20 milliamps, I'm gonna say that I have a bad signal because I've overranged my signal, or I'm going 2.5 below four milliamps, I've underranged my signal. I've got a problem with my signal coming in. So now I've set up a temperature, but I've just set it up as an analog input. Most devices, the first thing you do is you range and scale what the input is 
but then I still need to go into the device itself. In this case, I'll go into a meter run and I'll go to temperature and let's say meter temperature. And I need to tell it, hey, for temperature, look at your analog input, go to your module, go to analog input number two, and it'll come up as temperature. And then it'll read what the temperature is. And in this case, it's gonna be nothing because I don't have an analog input put into it. But if I was to force that real quick, and let's take a look and see what my temperature is. Right now, it's at a fallback value of 45.05. And you can see my temperature is fluctuating. So I'm gonna go into my IO real quick and I'll do a little diagnose, uh, diagnostics and I'll see that I really have nothing coming in. Zero milliamps, and remember we're from four to 20. So I've got absolutely nothing coming in and I've got no percent of span. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and force that analog input and I'm gonna put it at 50% of span and we'll force that on. So quiz time, if I'm forcing my analog input to 50% of my span, first of all, what should my temperature be at 50% of my span? And what should the analog value be at 50% of my span? Perfect. <laughs> no. So my analog input value at 50%, Hey, Brent, your um, mic muted a bit after 50% of your span. Sorry, having a little technical difficulties. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay, sorry about that. So if, uh, if I've got a four to 20 milliamp signal and I put it at 50% of my span and I have a 16 milliamp span, what should my signal be? Well, it should be 50% of that. So 50% of 16 is eight, eight plus four is 12. So my, my milliamp value should be 12 if, I, if I'm at 50%. So what should my process value be? What should my temperature be right now? Well, if it's minus 50 to 150, that gives me a 200 degree span. Half of 200 degrees should be 100. So when I go look at my temperature, my meter temperature should be well, it's still a forced input, I'm sorry. My meter temperature should be higher than this, but I messed up my, uh, my startup of it. So I'll go back and fix that later. Nothing like having a bad example when you go show something. <laughs> <laughs> so um, are there any question, questions about four to 20 million amp loops? What do we use them for? Well, we, we use them for a ton of different things. So I can use a four to 20 milliamp loop for temperature. I can use it for pressure. I can actually use it for flow. So I could be, instead of a pulse input, I could have a milliamp input coming in for uh, flow rate. If I'm sending a flow rate out to uh, a customer, I can send an analog output to the customer. I'm gonna vary the resistance on that loop and I'll go to, a, a let's say, an analog output here. So for an analog output, I might have that as an indicated flow rate or a mass flow rate or density, S and W. So a lot of different processes you can send across that analog output. The thing we have to be aware of when we set up analog inputs and outputs is if I set a scaling factor from zero to 100, so I've got this scale of what is, what is zero and what is 100% of my scale, then I need to make sure the device sending me that information is also scaled the same way. So if I have a transmitter that I'm getting a four to 20 milliamp signal out of, I have to go into that transmitter and tell it what four milliamps is and tell it what a hundred milli or um, 20 milliamps is. So I can make sure that on my side, 
that 4 milliamps is equal to negative 50 and 100 milliamps is equal to 150, let's say. And I make sure that that, that scaling is the same. So if my scaling's off, my process value has, is off. I have to know what I'm sending out, what it's mapped to, and I have to know as it's coming in, what that value is also. So keep that, keep that in mind. That's one of the things we also check. The other thing that we do is with analog inputs and analog outputs is we have to calibrate that resistance in the wire. So just because I'm sending four milliamps out doesn't mean that you're actually receiving four milliamps in. So what we can do is we can go in and do a calibration. So when I have a, a certified device hooked up where I can measure milliamps or the end device, let's say I'm going to another, another device or I've got a transmitter that I can simulate four to 20 milliamps out of, I can come into the flow computer and say, okay, I want to see a current reference value of four milliamps. But this is what I'm actually reading from the device. And I'll tell the, the person or I may on my handheld or by means of changing something in there, then set that device to give me four milliamps out. And what I may see is that it's not four milliamps, it's actually 3.89 milliamps. And I'll recalibrate that point to tell it, no, this is truly four milliamps. This is what the, the other device is telling me more is four milliamps. And then I may do a half scale, so 12 milliamps, and I'll have the device give me 12 milliamps. And then I'll do another step and say 20 milliamps, and then I'll have the device give me 20 milliamps output. And if it's off, I'll recalibrate those points, and then I'll set it back. I'll also do that for analog outputs. Now, if I'm the one who's giving an output, instead of that person calibrating their input, I'll go through and I'll actually increase or decrease my output at zero and then lock that in and say, okay, this is what that person needs to see for four milliamps or 0% of the process. And I'll go through and do the same thing. I'll go to 50% of the process and 100% of the process and I'll increase or decrease it. And what that does is both on the input and the output, it creates a linearized, linearized calibration curve or an output curve or an input curve to know that there's a slight offset in uh, what the actual voltages we're reading. So obviously the more points I can do on the curve, the more accurate I'm gonna be on my output or input. So in this case, this is set up for a three point curve, but we actually have the ability to do a five point curve in some of the devices or even farther. So that's on the, uh, the calibration inputs and the calibration outputs for analogs. So are there any questions? See if we have anything over there before we stop this one. Nope, just lost the sound for a few seconds. Well, again, we appreciate you taking the time, uh, spend a half an hour with us this morning to go over uh, analogs, they're, they're fun. As we go on with this series, we're actually working on uh, the ability to use different camera views and bring in some of the process information so we can see live on the devices of hooking up transmitters and testing the signals out. And we'll break those down into small uh, videos and, and post those up on also quick troubleshooting of instrumentation and things like that across a, a bunch of different things excuse me, a bunch of different vendors. But if at any time you have any technical support questions or any questions about the lessons that we've just gone over, then please shoot us an email, give us a call. If there's some topics that you wanna go over yourself or you would like us to talk about, please do the same, give us an email or call. Be safe, have a good rest of the day and uh, we will see you during the next video.